there are thousands of, lit, of papers that have been published uh, in, uh, on ice accretion. If you go to googlescholar.com and, uh, and, and just type heat transfer with ice accretion, you're going to come up with hundreds of papers. And if you, if you make it more broad, you're going to get uh, several thousand papers. Uh, the paper that I would like to, uh, to cite here uh, is the paper that was uh, written by my colleague here from uh, Boeing, and he alluded to that this morning, uh, 99 pages long, and it took him five years to write, and, it's, it, and I can see why, why it took him five years. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very nice piece of work, uh, uh, up to 2001, uh, of, uh, of research. Uh, you know, uh, if you want to get the latest and greatest in that field, uh, more, more maybe from the, hydro, the, from the aerodynamic standpoint, uh, that the way he wrote the paper. But um, uh, if you, if you uh, follow uh, the, the most recent uh, work in the past 13 years or so, then there's even more. And I'm, I'm just absolutely amazed as to how much there is. Uh, Professor Michael Bragg, who is an uh, uh, advisor of my colleague from Boeing, is, is very well known a person from the University of Illinois, was at Ohio State at uh, some point. And, uh, I have known him. Uh, I've never met the guy, but uh, I've just seen many, many, many uh, of his papers. Uh, a very, very uh, meticulous guy, uh, and uh, uh, great, great work that he has done. <coughs> but, but uh, some of you may not know even this: that, that uh, the early part of the 20th century, we're talking about when ice, when ice accretion become became uh, an issue that uh, we wanted to look into. And of course, uh, a good amount of the work was done in the, in the late 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, the, the, the predecessor of NASA, the, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, otherwise known as NACA, N-A-C-A, uh, there was a lot of reports. Uh, I happened to have stumbled into a lot of these reports when I was working for the Air Force in 1994. I was at the Arnold Engineering Development Center in uh, uh, near Tullahoma, Tennessee, where the University of Tennessee Space Institute is. And uh, uh, near Tullahoma, Tennessee, there's a small town by the name of Manchester, Tennessee. It's about, uh, uh, they have two gas stations, uh, a Walmart, and, and about maybe 900 people living in the city. And, and I, I was there for the whole summer. Uh, naturally, I ended up spending a good amount of my time on the base itself. Uh, they have a big icing tunnel, and uh, we, uh, we did some work. Uh, of course, I had access to the Air Force Library at the time. It was a candy store for me. Uh, they had uh, everything and anything that you could f want to have in icing. Uh, there was no PDF copies at the time. We're talking a long time ago. So I ended up uh, copying hard copies, crates after crates after crates, of NASA reports, NACA reports, technical memorandum, technical notes, contractor reports, what, whatever you can think of, I had. And I still have those. I value them very much. Uh, many of the work that I have had access to, in fact, uh, was analytical solutions of, of the icing problem. And I'm going to show you how, how it sort of evolved uh, from the 1940s till today. I'm going to show you the kind of uh, empiricism that, that that they used to have then versus what they do today. So I'm, I'm going to take you into a, a historical journey, if you like, on that. So, so the outline of the presentation is going to be uh, essentially to describe some of the methods that are used. And then I'm going to show you the results. Now, I'm going to actually start with the second part of the presentation before the, the first part. Uh, the, the concept is tell them what you're going to tell them, and then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I will tell you. And then I'll tell you what I told you. So that's sort of what I'm, I'm going to do. And if you're confused, that's, that's OK. Um, so first, a couple of definitions. Icing uh, occurs when, when the aircraft flies in a cloud of what we call the supercooled water droplets. OK? And, and there are two types of ice that, uh, that can accrete. One is the so-called rime ice, and the other one is the glazed ice. I'm going to show you uh, a picture of, of the two and then explain uh, the difference in just a second here. 
So here, here's, here's a picture, and, and I, uh, uh, this, I, I took this from uh, a paper by Professor Greg Netterer from the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. Uh, he's showing you, he, he is showing you the, uh, the rime ice. You can see the rime ice here, and this is the glazed ice. And now, in the case of the glazed ice, you can see that there is a, a, an unfrozen water layer here. The unfrozen water layer uh, is because of the fact that in the case of the glazed ice, uh, you are actually operating near the freezing point, and you're operating with a very heavy uh, uh, medium of, of liquid droplets. In other words, you've got a lot of liquid droplets uh, in, uh, in the vicinity of the freezing point, and the likelihood is that the, the ice is not going to, uh, the ice here is going to be more, uh, more uh, clear, clear picture, uh, whereas the, uh, the rime ice is going to be more opaque. And uh, the density of rime ice is less than one gram per centimeter cube, whereas the density of glazed ice is about one gram per centimeter cube. In other words, it's, it approximates more the water behavior than the ice behavior or shall I say the frost behavior, okay. So that's sort of the difference between the two. Now, uh, just to, uh, to make one point about the degree of complication of this problem, because that problem continues to be very complex and continues to be one of the problems that, that have not been fully resolved, and I, I don't anticipate that it will be fully resolved in the foreseeable future. Now, what I'm showing you, what I'm showing you here is a, a picture showing you the, uh, the, 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 the time-dependent behavior or the time-dependent nature of the unfrozen liquid layer that's, that is present in, 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 uh, in glazed ice. Now, not only is the glazed ice going to be more complex, and I'm going to show you in some of the predictions that that, uh, that are being done today, uh, but it also is time dependent. So now the, the, the element of time is present, and that's, that's what the, the, the objective of this picture is. It, you, can see that, you can see that time is on the horizontal axis, and then the, 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 layer, the water layer thickness, or the unfrozen thick uh, layer of water, is actually, it, uh, it increases with time, and then it sort of tapers off in the end. Now, what I would like to then uh, move you to is the, the, the nature of the energy fluxes that, that exist. As far as heat transfer goes, we've got heat transfer going into the aeronautical structure and heat transfer coming out of the aeronautical structure. If you look at the heat transfer going into the aeronautical structure, you're looking at uh, that heat transfer due to uh, freezing, uh, aerodynamic heating, droplet kinetic energy, and external uh, sources such as the de-icing heater, for example. Now, the, the fluxes that are coming out of the aeronautical structure would be in the, in, the, in the form of convection, heat transfer, possibly even radiation heat transfer, evaporation, sublimation, droplet warming, and aft conduction. All of these are fluxes that you have to account for in order for you to be able to do the energy balance on the structure. Now, as you know, when you're dealing with an airfoil or an aircraft wing, you're going to have the leading edge of the airfoil and the trailing edge of the airfoil. Unfortunately, the, the, because of the geometrical nature of, of this airfoil, what you're going to see is that the, uh, the, the, the leading edge requires a different treatment than the trailing edge. And, and you're going to always have this, uh, these two, these two uh, locales identified and of course in between you're going to have uh, to deal with the issue in between which is neither the front or the back. This is uh, the, the mass balance of course whenever there is mass there is energy uh, two faces to, uh, uh, to the same coin essentially so if you look if you take a look at the aeronautical structure that you have in front of you What you're going to see, this is a control volume here. 
you, you've, got, uh, you've got the free stream. You've got uh, a bunch of uh, super cool uh, droplets uh, heading towards the structure, the wing, for example. And uh, you have the boundary layer, which separates. Uh, you know the boundary layer separates the solid surface from the free stream. And this, uh, this, the viscous forces here are larger than otherwise. Now, you've got, you've got in theory, you've got some water layer. And we're talking here uh, glazed eyes. Now, the water layer, part of it is going to go into the control volume, and part of it is going to be out of the control volume. We call that the run back. Uh, and this is the run back in, and this is the run back out. Some of that water is going to go into the pores of the ice layer that's already on the, stru on the structure. The, the ice, uh, depending on how, how porous that ice actually is, uh, the more porous it will allow more water to seep into the pores of that ice layer on the structure. So that, that water that's going into the ice is what we call the residual and remaining uh, water. And that has to be accounted for as well. And if you try to translate this into heat transfer or heat fluxes, then we, we're looking at the energy balance side of things. And what you're looking at right now is every piece of mass that went in or went out has energy being carried with it. And therefore, you're going to have to account for it. For example, the water that's coming in, that this water here, part of it may freeze. And as a consequence, heat will be removed from that water layer. And where is that heat going to go? It's going to go into the structure. The residual and remaining water that is here that has sensible heat uh, flux part of it, which, which, which is proportional to the temperature difference between the water and the surface of the structure. The, the droplets that are coming uh, towards the structure, these droplets have kinetic energy. And when they hit the surface, this kinetic energy is going to have to transform itself into another form of energy, and it's going to be in the form of thermal energy. That thermal energy is going to actually be used to melt some of the ice, and it's going to interact uh, uh, from the energy standpoint with the structure, what we call uh, droplet kinetic energy. You've got sensible the run back in has a sensible heat, and then the run back out has a sensible heat. You've got convection. Uh, you've, got, uh, you've got convection heat transfer from the structure, radiation heat transfer from the structure. You've got, if, uh, you've got adiabatic saturation uh, process uh, going on. You've got evaporation and sublimation going on. All of that is happening at the same time. Evaporation, sublimation, convection and radiation, and droplet warming, and after conduction, and all the phase change processes that are taking place. Uh, you've got sublimation is a transformation from solid to vapor bypassing the liquid phase. And uh, you're looking at solidification of the water layer on, on, the, on, on top of the ice layer. You've got water seeping through the ice layer and freezing as it goes through the ice layer, freezing, and therefore increasing the density of the lower ice sublayers versus the density of the upper sublayers. You've got, you've got the, the, the density of that ice layer is not uniform because you've got more more dense in the lower sublayer here is because as the water f seeps into the ice, it freezes as it goes through the ice, and therefore it makes the ice uh, more dense towards the solid surface and less dense towards the free stream. I'm, I'm telling you all this because I want, you to, I, I want you to appreciate the degree of complexity that's involved in this problem, okay? And, 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 and that's why um, I was joking with my friends yesterday. I was telling them that we're going to have a job for life 
because but the problem will never get solved in our lifetime. So, so I have a, go a good job. Uh, uh, you know, they, they, they kid me that I'm more too worried about my job, losing my job, but, but uh, you can understand where I'm coming from. So now I'm going to take you to the modern times, and then I'll take you back to history. Okay, this is modern times uh, where we are now able to, with uh, solving the uh, governing conservation equations, we're able to, in fact, predict the droplet trajectory. This is actually from uh, Fortin et al. in the Journal of uh, Applied Thermal Sciences in 2006. They published this paper, and uh, they are able to predict the droplet trajectory. And here they are showing us two uh, cases where the liquid water mass is coming at minus 28 degrees versus uh, a, a much higher temperature, uh, so something in the vicinity of minus 4, minus 4.4, as a matter of fact. Now, you're going to see for yourself the difference between the liquid mass distribution at a much lower temperature versus the liquid mass distribution at a much higher temperature. This is the one at minus 28 degrees. If you look at the one at minus 4 degrees, and the color codes uh, show you the impinging versus the remaining versus the run back versus the shedding. These are all different uh, classifications of, of what happens to the water on top of the ice layer. Now, I should point out that the location where it says zero here, that is exactly the location of the leading edge of the airfoil. Okay, so you can see that this is where a good amount of activities are going on. A stagnation point, so to speak. Now, here is one of the things that I don't think in the 1940s and 50s they were able to model very well, which is the so-called roughness or local roughness and how the roughness interacts with all of that. Now, as you know, the, the, the layer of ice that's going to form on the structure is going to have a rugged surface, a rugged profile. It's not going to be a nice and smooth one. So it's going to have some ruggedness to it. And this ruggedness is going to translate into, uh, into a higher skin friction coefficient, which uh, if, you, if you have had good uh, courses in fluid mechanics, you would know that that, that is going to affect, uh, um, it's going to affect the, uh, indirectly affect the amount of heat transfer or the heat transfer coefficient. They are not unrelated, I should say. And that's, that's not to say they are related, I'm saying they are not unrelated. So there is going to be an indirect relationship there. Said differently, if you were to, to predict the convective heat transfer coefficient, which is crucial, it's a crucial quantity in order for you to be able to solve this problem, you're going to have to be able to actually predict the roughness or the local roughness distribution uh, on the surface. Now, this is a, a distribution for the local heat transfer coefficient, uh, convective heat transfer coefficient, again, as a function of uh, the, the curvilinear uh, distance along the airfoil. So this is, this is the distance that's going like that. It's not a linear distance. It's a curvilinear distance. Now, it's showing you for two temperatures, one at minus 28 and one at minus 4, and, and I say... Uh, my, my observation is, oh my God, there is a huge difference between the minus 28 and the minus 4. Not surprisingly, the minus 4 is the more troublesome one. Why is that? Because it's near the freezing point. It's minus 4 near the freezing point. There is all kinds of potential activities going on. The nature of the ice is going to be a glazed ice. Glazed ice is associated with a liquid layer film with all the goodies that go with that, including seeping into the pores of the ice layer and all that. 
So now you can see that at the, you can see that at the point of more activities, there is a huge surge for the minus four degree scenario. Let us go back in history for just a little bit. I want to go back in history for just a little bit because I want to show you, I want to make a point here, and that is that the local heat transfer coefficient or the convective heat transfer coefficient, which was in the center stage in terms of computing the heat transfer rate, that a convective heat transfer coefficient is one of the one of the fluxes that you have to compute. But, but more importantly than that, the convective heat transfer coefficient is related to the convective mass transfer coefficient through the Lewis analogy. So the higher the heat transfer coefficient, the higher the mass transfer coefficient, and vice versa. So if you are to, in fact, to predict the, the, the profile of, of, of the ice accreting on the aeronautical structure, you're going to have to have a good way of predicting the heat transfer coefficient because that is going to be your gateway to the local mass transfer coefficient. Not, not because that you love the heat transfer coefficient per se. You, you love it. Of course you love it. But you love it even more because it affects the local mass transfer coefficient. So now it has, uh, it has this double, double jeopardy that if you, if you miss it, if you didn't compute it correctly, you're not only going to miss the heat transfer flux, but you're going to miss the mass transfer flux as well. So what I have done is I have collected, there are really five pieces of literature that I put my hands on. And I'm going to show you, uh, the first one is, uh, is the Lewis, uh, the NASA Lewis, now NASA Glenn, uh, uh, they have a code, uh, they, they called it Lou Ice, I think that's the right way to pronounce it. For Lewis, for Lewis Ice code, and that is a, it's an NASA contractor report published in May 1995. Okay, so so make, mark mark the calendar for Lou Ice as one of the references. Then we're going to look at uh, another code. By the way, this code is a two-dimensional code, two-dimensional predictive code. The next one is, uh, is also a two-dimensional code, and it's called, uh, they refer to it as a CIRA, C-I-R-A. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. And then the third piece of literature is actually experimental work by uh, Shin and Bond. They published this in a NASA technical manual in January of 1992. I'm going to refer to that as the experimental uh, program that we're going to compare with. And then last but not least is the work by uh, Fortin uh, in Applied Thermal Sciences where, where, he, uh, where they actually looked into the effect of the local roughness or the local roughness distribution on all of that. And there's one more piece of work I'm going to refer to it later on. So what I'm going to show you right now is I'm going to show you uh, current day predictive capability based on uh, their, their model and, and how, how it all compares, compares to the other, the other three different uh, methods. You see the blue line here is, is the uh, work by Fortin and, uh, and his group. And then you've got the red is the actual measurements by uh, Shin and Fond. And then you got the blue ice is the, the light blue, and then Sierra is the light is the pink or purple. I think that's more like purple or pink. Now this is at uh, minus 28 degrees. That is supposed to be in theory. It's supposed to be rime ice. Okay, that's supposed to be rime ice. Now, I want you to observe. I'm going to move, move the cursor a little fast to make it more like a cartoon. I don't have the capability, the video capabilities that my previous friends had, so I'm going to use old, good old-fashioned, uh, move the picture fast enough, and you will see the cartoon behavior here. So let me just see if I can do that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, go back. Two, one, two, too many. Okay, now you can see that you can see the distribution 
changing. I'm moving back into the direction of higher, uh, of lower temperature, meaning more rime ice, less glazed ice. If I move into the direction of lower temperatures, I'm going to be moving into glazed ice with the more troublesome one. So you can see now at minus 8 versus minus 19 versus minus 13, minus 10, minus 7, minus 6, minus 4. And, and in all of those cases, what you have seen is a distribution of the ice accreting on that aeronautical structure based on the predictive capabilities that, uh, that Fortran and Laforte had developed. Now, here is the fifth paper that I was referring to. And that, that paper is by uh, Cal at all in aerospace science and technology in 2012. This is not too long ago. And the reason I got this is that they, they refer to something I'm going to refer to in about five more minutes, which is called the local collection efficiency. If you have read the, 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 the 1940s and the 1950s reports I have read, you will realize, you will reach the following conclusion, that the local collection efficiency is a big problem. First of all, let me define what the local collection efficiency actually is. The local collection efficiency is a quantity whose magnitude is a measure of how much of the liquid water that falls on the structure is captured by the structure. So, so here you have all this liquid water coming towards the structure, the wing, a portion of that liquid water will be retained by the wing. It could be ice, it could be uh, uh, water that seeps into the ice, whatever it is, it's going to be retained by the wing. It will not go anywhere. How much of that wing is, how much of that water the wing is going to be able to, to retain versus how much water has actually fallen onto it is what we call the local collection efficiency. The symbol for that is beta. I think I'm pleased to tell you that, that, that this symbol has survived the test of time. Rarely do they do that, but this symbol has survived the test of time. And the local collection efficiency, the larger the amount, the more retention of that liquid water will be on the structure. Now, our friends uh, who published the paper in aerospace science and technology have given you a distribution of the local collection efficiency for two angles of attack. Zero degree angle of attack and six degree angle of attack. Now, I'm going to take you back in time in just a little bit and I'm going to show you how they did it then before these guys were able to... I, I'm not telling you the, the, the details of the technique they used here. That's beyond the scope of this lecture. But all I can tell you is that they used more sophisticated techniques than the one I'm going to show you in, in a little bit. So in, in a problem like this, I want to, as, a, as a, my friend from Boeing today used uh, trash in, trash out, I'm going to take his, uh, uh, plagiarize his, uh, partially plagiarize his statement and tell you that what is it that you want to put in and what is it that you want to get out? Because unless you know what you're going to put in and what you're going to get out, you're not going to be able to solve the problem. So I'm going to go with a laundry list of things that you need to know a priori in advance, which include the altitude of the aircraft, the flight speed, or the Mach number. Then what we call the volume or the volume median droplet diameter, okay, the size of the droplet. We're going to take this, the volume median droplet diameter. We call it D-drop. And then the equilibrium surface temperature, we need to sort of have a good guess of what that is. We need to know the geometry. And we need to know the angle of attack. If you don't have any of these things, then you are sort of deficient about exactly the input parameters to the problem. 
Then you have what we call free stream conditions, which should be reasonably uh, calculable from the information you have. For example, the free stream pressure, you should be able to have that. The free stream temperature, you should be able to have that. The free stream density, you should be able to have that. The free stream kinematic viscosity, you should be able to have that. And the free stream thermal conductivity, you should be able to have that. And I say you should be able to have that as opposed to saying you have that. You should be able to have that and implies that there's going to be a little bit of work that you're going to have to do to get it. It's not going to be readily available. to Nobody's going to give it to you on a silver platter. Now, one of the things you're going to need to do at some point is compute the boundary layer edge velocity. The boundary layer edge velocity, you know the boundary layer is defined as a layer between the fluid and the solid surface where the velocity at the edge of that layer is 99% of the free stream value. Right? Something along those lines. So what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to find a way to compute the, the edge velocity, that is the velocity at the edge of the boundary layer. Now you're going to have to do that for each locale on the, sh on the structure. So the structure, the, the, aeronaut, the, the, the airfoil is this way. You're going to have to get the edge velocity on each location on that airfoil. There is an equation for that, which I'm not giving you here, but uh, it, it goes back to 1946 by Abbott et al., 1946. I can't remember whether this was a NASA technical memorandum, uh, NACA technical memorandum or, or uh, a technical note, but it was one of those old things that I have in my library. Once you get the boundary layer edge velocity, then you're going to be able to get the boundary layer edge pressure and temperature. And if you could use these two equations, and these were, were very common things they used, uh, assuming that the air behaves as, as if the water present into the air does not have an effect on the behavior of the air. Sometimes, Sometimes you get lucky and you have the coefficient of pressure distribution. If you have the coefficient of pressure distribution, you could actually use that to compute the pressure at the edge of the boundary layer and then use that information to compute the edge velocity. In other words, do it sort of backward. And if that's the case, then the edge velocity would be as a function of, of the, the, the coefficient of pressure and uh, would be a function of the, of, the, of the edge pressure, which is a function of the coefficient of pressure. Okay, so add to the laundry list of things what they call the modified inertia parameter. And the modified inertia parameter is, uh, is a quantity that is a function of the droplet, median droplet diameter, the volume median droplet diameter, and a function of the properties of uh, the, the density and the viscosity and the, the location on the airfoil. And then we come to our preferred quantity, which is the local collection efficiency. Remember, the local collection efficiency was computed by those guys back in 2012. It was a nice, nice color distribution on, on exactly how, how it, 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 it's uh, distributed on the airfoil. But during those times, back in the early part of work on ice, accretion on surfaces, they were using more primitive means. And I'm not going to tell you all the, de the glory details, but there's a lot there in this particular aspect of it. The local collection efficiency is a big, huge uh, black hole, if you like. And uh, a lot of guesswork has been, has been done over the years to get it. because it depends on the inertia of the impinging droplets and the aerodynamic drag and other things. Now, once you have that local collection efficiency, this is the magic quantity that if you multiply by the cloud liquid water content times the free stream velocity, you're going to get the local mass flux that's impinging on the surface. Now, this is one of the main things you need to have. The local mass flux that's impinging on the surface is going to be 
a function of the, 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 the cloud liquid water content, how much water there is in terms of like gram per meter cube, and then the free stream velocity, how fast the air is moving, and how much are you able to capture from the liquid that is coming onto the surface, how much are you going to be able to retain, which is expressed in the local collection efficiency here, the beta. Then we come to computing the heat transfer coefficient, the convective heat transfer coefficient. Now, no matter how we, we slice it, the, the local heat transfer coefficient is heavily rely, relying on empiricism. You know that if you open a convective heat transfer book, a, a good amount of that is empirical formulas. And uh, this is one of the empirical formulas that was suggested for the leading edge. For the trailing edge, you get into uh, the laminar regime and the turbulent regime. So you have one equation for the laminar and one equation for the turbulent, for the trailing edge. And then you compute the thermal conductivity of the air by this equation. This is one of the formulas that were proposed. The thermal conductivity is a function of temperature. You know that. And if you don't know the thermal conductivity, and if you have the Nusselt number, you're not going to be able to compute the local convective heat transfer coefficient. So you need the thermal conductivity to be able to take the Nusselt number that you just computed from these two, form two or three formulas I gave you to be able to translate that Nusselt number into uh, a convective heat transfer coefficient. And, and once you have the convective heat transfer coefficient, this is a quantity that's uh, it's an undimensional quantity. We call it the relative heat factor. It's actually the ratio between the, uh, the, the mass of flux multiplied by the specific heat of water divided by the convective heat transfer coefficient. In fact, this quantity is non-dimensional. Kilojoules, uh, kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin for Cw, uh, m double prime i is in kilogram per meter square second per second, and then h is in, in, uh, in, in joules uh, per second per meter square per Kelvin, and then you're going to see that actually it will, it will cancel out. The units will cancel out. Now, then you get into having to make a decision on the mass flux of the fraction of water that's impinging on the surface and freezing into ice. Now, a portion of the, a, a portion of the water that's coming onto the surface has decided to stay with the surface, and a portion of what decided to stay on the surface decided to freeze into ice. I'm, I'm, putting, I'm putting a mind into the, into the water droplets here. The water droplets have a mind. A portion of the water that's incoming, the structure, decided to stick around. And a portion of those that decided to stick around decided to freeze. You're going to have to know one way or the other how much has decided to freeze. So we have a term called the freezing fraction, which is given by this quantity N sub F there, freezing fraction. That is a big mystery, uh, and somebody has to decide on it. Then this is the heat flux to the surface due to freezing. Of course, now that you know how much has actually frozen, you can compute the amount of heat that goes into that, which is composed of a sensible component and a latent component. This uh, quantity is a boundary layer recovery factor introduced by, uh, by Hardy in 1946. And it, is a f it's, uh, it enters into, into this aerodynamic, into aerodynamic heating. Aerodynamic heating is given by this equation. And you can see that the boundary layer recovery factor here, R, is a little symbol embedding itself into this quantity here. You're going to have to get that. That's empirical in nature. A lot of empiricism, like I said. This is the other flux that you need to compute, which is the, the, the droplet kinetic energy, which, which is a heat that is, that is transformed by, by the droplets, that will actually evaporate. In other words, the maximum potential for evaporation is a quantity, a portion of which is going to be the actual amount that will actually evaporate. And that's what we call the evaporation, 
the evaporation fraction. Now, in order for you to be able to compute the potential for evaporation or the maximum amount that can evaporate, you're going to have to compute the vapor pressure because the evaporation is a, is a diffusion-driven phenomenon, and that diffusion-driven phenomenon is governed by Fick's law of diffusion, meaning that, that the mass will diffuse from the higher concentration region into the lower concentration region, and the driving force is going to be what we call the, the vapor pressure driving force or the concentration driving force. The concentration is a function of the vapor pressure. The higher the vapor pressure, the higher the concentration. The lower the vapor pressure, the lower the concentration. So if you have a region of higher vapor pressure and a region of lower vapor pressure, then what happens is the vapor will migrate from the high region, the high pressure region, into the lower pressure region. Therefore, it's vital that you compute the vapor pressure. Unfortunately, the vapor pressure itself is a function of temperature. So you can see that you cannot just have a numerical constant for that, but you're going to have to do it as a function of the actual uh, temperature. And you, you saw that, that, uh, uh, that the quantity lambda sub e, that's the thermal conductivity, I'm sorry, that's uh, the, the latent heat of vaporization, and the latent heat of vaporization is itself a function of temperature. So these are the equations that you could use for that. Now, what I gave you, the equation I gave you for the vapor pressure is actually the vapor pressure when the water droplets are not super cool. Now, there are, there are cases when you have... So, so... So the law of conservation of mass tells us that mass can never be created nor destroyed. So what do you do if the air that is present in the vicinity of the airfoil is unable to carry the moisture that is present under the prevailing temperature? What do you do? Pop quiz. Okay, I want pop quiz. I want immediate answers to that quiz. Water can never be created nor destroyed. Matter can never be created nor destroyed. Water is matter, therefore, what you do is you excess water. If the excess water cannot exist in the form of water vapor, what do you think is going to happen? Because the air cannot carry more than what it can carry. If the air is sat saturated, then it's saturated. Cannot take any more. Say, I don't have any room for you, then what do you do? What you do is the water vapor will, in fact, transform itself into, guess what? Liquid water, if you are above freezing. And it will transform itself into ice crystals if it's below freezing. So water, is going to, water vapor is going to be adaptable to the situation. If it can't exist in the form of water vapor, it will exist either as suspended liquid droplets or suspended ice crystals. Bad news for us, if it's suspended liquid droplets, the vapor pressure equation that you use is different than if it's not, if it's, if it's in the form of water vapor. If it's in the form of water vapor, there is an equation for the vapor pressure. If it's in the form of ice crystals or liquid droplets, there are other equations that you have to use. I'm going to show you the equation that you need to use to compute the vapor pressure if you have an excess amount of liquid present. And there is a comparable equation if you have an excess amount of liquid present under freezing conditions, meaning on, in the form of ice crystals. And then once you compute the heat transfer coefficient, then you compute the mass transfer coefficient. For example, you could use the Lewis analogy for that. And don't forget the coefficient of mass diffusion from air, from water vapor to air, the coefficient of mass diffusion is a function of temperature itself. This is one possible equation to compute. And then you get into the same issues with the sublimation problem. You got the evaporation problem resolved. Now you do the sublimation problem. This is the maximum amount of, of sublimation, what we call the sublimation potential. And you compute, uh, you're going to find that when the sublimation happens, you're going to have to decide. Uh, now the sublimation potential is a quantity, is a big quantity. A portion of that will actually sublime or sublimate. So you need to have what they call a sublimation fraction and go into the same, the same thought process as the evaporation fraction and the freezing fraction. 
you can see that the problem is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle. You're going from, it's a, I call it a Chinese puzzle. You go from one into another, into another, into another, and you, you sort of see no way in sight. I'm going to fast forward and tell you that in conclusions, I'm, I've given you sort of a, a, a history and a, a present day, I accelerated into the present day calculations, which now we have uh, more computer capability than we did back in the 40s. Uh, and uh, here one thing I want to leave you with is the local roughness that is directly dependent on the skin friction coefficient and indirectly dependent on the heat transfer, which actually enters into the overall uh, overall uh, game that you have to really play and play well in order for you to be able to predict the ice accretion on aeronautical structure. Thank you very much for your time.